Heavenly Father, uh, thanks for the privilege of being together, of studying your word, of hearing your voice, and of uh, struggling through, through tough questions in life, tough questions about you. Father, we pray that you would bless us and give us wisdom and insight and point us towards your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, right now, both in worship and in ABC, we're in this series. Uh, it is called God Questions, and the basic premise behind this series is this. If you are a sentient human being, then somewhere along the way, you have probably had some questions and asked some questions about God. And some of these questions start when we are very, very young. For example, when you're three or four or five years old, the biggest question that you have on your mind is, okay, so Noah had an ark. How did he get the dinosaurs on there, right? Right? Or uh, how about the fish? Did they have to come on the ark since they could already swim? Some of you have probably never thought about that question before. But those are the kind of questions when you ask, that you ask when you're a little bit little. Uh, but, but as you grow and become older, uh, sometimes the questions become a little bit bigger and a little bit deeper and a little bit more profound and a little bit more troublesome. Uh, you, you begin to ask, okay, so uh, Noah had this ark. Are we sure that's true? What is the relationship between science and the Bible? Uh, does the Bible actually give us insight into science? Or for that matter, what's the relationship between the Bible and history? Is the Bible actually a historical book? That's a big question. Or uh, what about slavery? Isn't slavery supported by the Bible? Or isn't the Bible kind of regressive and oppressive? Uh, shouldn't we kind of move past what it says about God and have kind of a bigger and broader picture of God? Or, or how about Jesus? He says he's the only way to God. Isn't that kind of exclusionary for him to say something like that? These are the big questions that a lot of folks ask as they grow up and begin to have big questions about God and about faith. And that's what this series is devoted to tackle. This series is devoted to tackling some of the big questions that people have about God. Last weekend, as we kicked off our series, we asked probably the biggest question of all, and the biggest question is this, is there a God? Because the fact of the matter is, as I drop my remote, if there's not a God, uh, none of the other questions about God matter uh, because there's not a God to ask questions about in the first place. And so last weekend, we learned that even though we can't have some sort of an airtight proof for the existence of God, uh, this much we do know, there is a plausible argument for the existence of God. In fact, in a lot of ways, it is more plausible to believe that there is a God than it is to believe that there is not a God. Uh, next weekend, we're going to be asking this question, how do I relate to God? Because if there is a God, it'd be kind of nice to get to know who he is and to know whether or not he cares about me. Now, this weekend, as we continue our series, we're going to be asking this question, which is, is God good? Now, this question is a real old question. In fact, it is a classic and a long-standing question. People for years have been asking this question, is there a God who is good? And really, this question comes from a riddle. And the riddle goes something like this. If you believe in God, most people believe that God is all-powerful. Uh, the technical theological term for this is omnipotence. A uh, potentate is someone who has a lot of power. Omni means all. And uh, a lot of people believe that God is all-powerful. This is something the Bible actually affirms. So 115 verse 3, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. God can do whatever he wants because he is God. God is all powerful. That's the first part of this riddle. Second part of this riddle is God is also all good. Uh, the technical theological term for this, kind of a big word, omnibenevolence. Uh, the word omni, again, meaning all. Benevolence is a word that means love or care or compassion or grace. And so, a lot of people believe that there is a God who is all good. And again, this is something the Bible itself affirms. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger, and he's rich in love. The Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on all that he has made. God is good to all, the Bible says, because he is all good. God is omnibenevolent. And so the first part of this riddle is there's an all-powerful God, if you believe in God. The second part of this riddle is there's an all-good God, if you believe in God. But here's where the riddle gets complicated. There is also evil in this world. Now again, this is something the Bible itself affirms and concedes. Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Ephesians says we live in an evil world. We live in a fallen world, a broken world. Now here's the reason this is a riddle. Just logically... 
two of these premises can be true. But not all three of them can be true at the same time, just logically. In other words, you can have a God who is all-powerful, and you can have a God who is all-good. But if God is all-powerful and all-good, is God going to like evil, yes or no? No. And so is there going to be evil in the world, yes or no? No. That's the problem with the riddle. And so people have been trying to figure out this riddle for a long time. There are some people who will say, okay, I know there's evil in the world. I can empirically verify that. So we got to get rid of one of the two first parts of this riddle. We either got to get rid of an all-powerful God or an all-good God. And over the years, people have tried to get rid of one or both of them. Uh, There was a book that came out way back in 1981 by a Jewish rabbi. His name was Harold Kushner, and Harold Kushner grappled with this riddle. He wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And in his book, Kushner decided that he was going to deny the power of God because he couldn't figure out what other way a good God could allow evil to be in this world. Uh, This is what he wrote in his book. He said, I believe in God, but I don't believe the same things about him that I did years ago. When I was growing up or when I was a theological student, I recognized his limitations. I grew up believing in an all-powerful God, but there are two things in life that even God does not control. One is the laws of nature, and so hurricanes and tornadoes and bad stuff like that just happen, and the other is human choice. Humans are free to do terrible things. This does not diminish God. I'd rather worship a God who's completely good but not totally powerful than a God who is completely powerful but not completely good. Rabbi Kushner says if something has to go in God because there's evil in the world, it's going to be the power of God. I believe that God is good, but I don't believe that he's all-powerful. That's the way Rabbi Kushner solves this riddle. Now, there are other people who have kind of done the opposite thing. Uh, There's a book that came out years ago called Night by a guy named Eli Wiesel. It's a very profound book. Eli Wiesel was a Jew in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. And what he saw there was nothing short of horrifying. So horrifying, in fact, that he still believed in God and he still believed in the power of God. But he really struggled with the goodness of God because he couldn't understand how a good God would allow what happened in concentration camps to happen. Uh, This is what he writes at night. He said, blessed be God's name. Why but why would I bless him? Because he caused thousands of children to burn in his mass graves. Because he kept six crematoria working day and night, including Sabbath and the holy days. Because in his great might he had created Auschwitz, Birkenau, Buna, and so many other factories of death. How could I say to him, blessed be thou, almighty, master of the universe, who chose us among all nations to be tortured day and night, to watch as our fathers, our mothers, our brothers end up in the furnaces. Praised be thy holy name for having chosen us to be slaughtered on thine altar. That's very honest from Eli Wiesel. He's going, I'm not sure I can believe in a God who's good. Not when terrible stuff like this is happening. And Eli Wiesel actually sets us up for our question today because Eli Wiesel is struggling with our question for today. There's evil in the world. And if there is a God, and if he has all this power, how in the world can a God with all this power not use his power to stop evil if God is so good? Is God good? That's the question. Now, to get at this question, we're going to be taking a look at a story from the Bible. This is the story of a man named Job. And I just want to begin by setting a little bit of background here for you. Uh, Pastor mentioned this in his message. Job is actually the oldest book that we have in the Bible. Uh, Moses was the guy who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses wrote those during the time of the Exodus. Uh, Job, a lot of scholars think, was written around the time of Abraham, which was several hundred years earlier. And Job struggles with this question, is God good? And so just from a historical perspective, quite literally, Literally, this is the oldest question in the book. This is a question that people have been struggling with for a long time. And Job takes 42 chapters to wrestle with this question. We're actually going to finish the book of Job today. All 42 chapters in 45 minutes, give or take six or seven hours. I'm not, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) But we are going to walk through the whole story of Job today. 
And so if you've got a Bible, uh, turn to Job 1. We're going to start at the very beginning of the book, Job 1, verse 1, and we'll dive in together. So uh, Job 1, verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God, and he shunned evil. Uh, I want to pause right there. Uh, I want to point your attention to where Job lives. Job 1, verse 1 says that Job lives in the land of Uz. Now, here's what you need to know about Uz. We don't really know where Uz was, but this much we do know, okay? It was not the land of Israel. Uh, The Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is philo-Semitic. In other words, it's very kind of interested in the Jewish people and Jewish culture and the nation of Israel and the ancient Israelites, uh, the Hebrews. It's very interested in their story and how God relates to this people. Uh, Job is not a Jew. Job is not an Israelite, and yet Job uh, has two things that are very important. Job has faith in God, and so faith in God extends outside of the borders of Israel, even in the Old Testament, and Job also has a lot of pain. Because pain is not just about Israel, pain is about humanity. Pain is a universal experience. And so in the land of us, there lived this man whose name was Job. Now, notice how Job is described in verse 1. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God, and he shunned evil. I want you to pick up on this word blameless. The Old Testament written in Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for blameless here is the word tom. Now, this is a word that often in the Old Testament is translated as the word perfect. Uh, For example, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect perfect, reviving the soul. The Hebrew word there for perfect is Tom. And so here's Job, and what is he called? He is called Tom. Here's the idea. Job is not only a good guy, he's a really good guy. He's not only a really good guy, he's a really, 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 really good guy. To use the words of the great theologian Mary Poppins, Job is practically perfect in every way. That's Job. In fact, here's how good he is, Job 1 verse 2. Job had seven sons and three daughters. Now, now pause right there and notice the number of sons and daughters that Job has because the numbering is important. Uh, Numbers often carry in the Bible kind of symbolic significance. Seven, which is how many sons Job has. Uh, Seven is a number in the Bible that denotes perfection and completeness, which is why God makes the heavens and the earth in six days, then he rests on the seventh to round it all out, because everything is complete, and everything is perfect. The number seven is a number of completeness. Then he has three daughters, which is also a number of perfection and a number of completeness. That's why we have one God, and yet Christian theology teaches that he is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he has seven sons, three daughters, like perfect number of sons, perfect number of daughters. Not only that, verse 3, he owns 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. Now notice we got the seven and the three again, but this time we multiply it by a thousand, which is another number of perfection in the Bible. If you go all the way to the back of the book, in the book of Revelation, you'll read about something called the millennium, which is a symbol of God's perfect rule and God's perfect reign. And so we have all this perfection all over the place. Job has a perfect family. Job has a perfect number of animals. Job has a perfect life. Verse 3 continues, Job also had 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. He had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and curse God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Notice what Job does in verse 5. He offers sacrifices. Why? Well, he's worried that perhaps his children have sinned and curse God in their hearts. Now, pick up on that word, perhaps. Job says, I'm going to offer a sacrifice not because one of my kids have sinned. I'm going to offer a sacrifice just in case one of my kids have sinned. In other words, we don't even have to do anything wrong for us to offer a sacrifice to God. Even the idea that maybe, possibly, it could be that somebody, somewhere in my family has done something wrong. I want to make sure that I'm doing something really good to balance out that thing that is wrong. This is Job. He's Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, and Ned Flanders from The Simpsons all wrapped into one. He is a great guy. There's like nobody better than this guy. And so here's the idea. If there's anyone 
who deserves to have good stuff happen to him because he is so good, it would be this guy. It would be Job. And yet, that's not the way the Job story turns out. Job 1 verse 6. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and he's upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan replied, does, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he'll surely curse you to your face. In the middle of this really good story about this really good guy who has a really good family and a really good life, in the middle of this story, there pops up a really bad actor whose name is Satan. Now again, Old Testament written in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for Satan uh, literally means accuser, and Satan's name actually describes Satan's function. Because when Satan shows up in heaven, in the throne room of God, here's what he does. He shows up to level an accusation. It's an accusation against Job, and he poses it in the form of a question in Job 1 verse 9. Here's the question. Does Job, Fear God for nothing. Now, this is actually the critical question of the whole book of Job. This is the biggest question in the book of Job. Because here's what Satan is essentially saying to God with this question. Does Job fear God for nothing? He's essentially saying, hey God, the only reason that Job is so good the only reason that Job is so pious, the only reason that Job serves you is because you have hooked him up. You have blessed his socks off. I mean, come on. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, a perfect family, a perfect life, so much cast that Jeff Bezos would be jealous. That's why he's so devoted to you. But the truth of the matter is, God, Job's love isn't really love for you. It's just love for himself. He only loves you the way children love an ice cream truck, the way a politician loves a voter. He only loves you because of what you can give to him. But God, I bet, I bet that if you turned off the faucet of blessing and stopped giving him all of this stuff, he would turn off the faucet of devotion. You take that stuff away, and he'll curse you to your face. The truth is, God, Satan says, you're actually kind of naive. This whole idea of a covenant of self-giving, selfless love between God and humans, where like humans love God just because, and God loves humans just because, that doesn't really work. Life is like this. It's tit for tat. It's all scratch your back if you scratch mine. You don't give just to give. You give so that you can get. That's the way life really works. And that's the accusation that Satan is making against Job. Job doesn't love you at all. He's not as good as he looks. Satan says of Job. Now here's the thing. God thinks Satan is wrong. And God's willing to try to prove it. Which is why God responds, Job 1 verse 12, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. I want you to notice something here, okay? Uh, Satan says to God back in verse 11 of Job 1, hey, why don't you sock it to Job and see if he still loves you? Uh, Satan says to God, you stretch out your hand and strike everything that Job has, and Job will surely curse you to your face. You know what God says to that request? No. 
He says, if that's what you want to happen, then you make it happen. Job 1 verse 12, everything he has, God says to Satan, is in your hands. But on the man himself, you don't lay a finger. We have a case of dueling pronouns here. Satan says to God, hey God, you destroy Job. God says to Satan, no, 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 if this is what you want then you make it happen. Now, this is important for us to remember because this is basic, but it's profound. Every sickness, every pain, every hurt, every disaster, everything that is not good is not of God. Satan is the one who is working evil in Job's life here. And by the way, he does a spectacular job at working evil in Job's life. Job 1 verse 13 One day when Job's sons and daughters were feeding and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and your daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of your house. It collapsed on them, and they are all dead. And I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. Think about this with me for just a second. Seven verses. That's how long this is. Verses 13 through 19 of Job 1. Seven verses. In seven verses, Job loses 7,000 oxen, 3,000 donkeys, 500 sheep, 500 camels, all of his servants, three daughters, and seven sons. Seven verses. And this was not only in the scope of a day, this was literally in the scope of just a couple of minutes. Because as soon as one bad thing happens, another bad thing happens. And as soon as another bad thing happens, yet another bad thing happens. Question, by a show of hands, anybody in here ever had a bad day? Raise your hand. Anybody? Anybody at all? Okay, next question. Anybody in here ever had a bad day as bad as Job's day? Okay, this is almost like a tragedy and a comedy wrapped all into one. It's a tragedy because it's awful. It's a comedy because what happens to Job in the scope of minutes is so far-fetched, it's absurd. This kind of stuff like can't happen in real life, right? And yet, and yet, look at how Job responds. Job 1 verse 20, at this, Job got up, He tore his robe, and he shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I was thinking about this. I start getting grouchy when traffic on 1604 slows down below 60 miles per hour. Job can lose everything he has. His money, his home, his livelihood, his kids. And you know what he does? He says, hmm, I think I'm going to go to church. I think I'm going to worship and praise the Lord. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Here's what Job is saying. Job is saying God is still good even when lots of bad things happen. Job still clings to his faith in God. Job still is a good guy even though God has allowed Satan to take away all of his blessings. Now, you would think that after this, Satan would be kind of humbled and humiliated, right? He would say, okay, that didn't exactly go the way that I had planned it. I thought that maybe if Job had all these calamities, Job would curse God to his face. He didn't. Whoopsie, maybe I should stop because I'm not ahead. I'm way behind. But Satan's not done yet. Job 2, beginning at verse 1 now. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth in it. 
Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless. He's upright. Still blameless and upright. Still a man who fears God and shuns evil. Still does. And he still maintains his integrity, God says, even though you incited me against him to ruin. And then pick up on this phrase, without any reason. A little bit more Hebrew here for you. Uh, the word for this phrase, without any reason, is the word kanam. And what's interesting is that this is the same word that Satan uses in his big question to God in Job 1 verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing? Uh, the word there for nothing is the word kanam. And so here's the idea. Job, he trusts God, he worships God, he loves God, he follows God, he fears God, kanam, without any reason, just because. Satan, however, he wants to destroy Job and hurt Job and be cruel to Job and steal all Job's blessings from Job, kanam, not because he has a good reason, just because of nothing. And so because of nothing... Because Satan can't seem to help himself, he takes another crack at Job. Job 2 verse 4, Satan says to God, skin for skin, a man will give all that he has for his own life. But if you stretch out your hand and you strike his flesh and bones, then he'll surely curse you to your face. I'm going to win this bet, Satan says to God. The Lord said to Satan, I'm not going to do that. He's in your hands. You want me to do this? No, you do this. But you must spare his life, God says to Satan. So Satan went out from the very presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, I mentioned this at the beginning. This book is 42 chapters. By the second chapter of this book, Job has gone from being incredibly blessed to being incredibly cursed. From having everything to having nothing. In fact, by this point, in chapter 2, the only thing Job has left is his wife. And she's not at her helpful best right now. Is that a nice way to say it? Job 2 verse 9, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Uh, years ago, there was a book that came out by Norman Vincent Peale. Some of you may have heard it before, The Power of Positive Thinking. She hadn't read that, had she? <laughs> but here's the thing. I can sympathize with her. I mean, if I was in her shoes, I'd probably be saying the same thing. Look at it from her perspective. Job has not only lost all his sons and all his daughters, Job's wife has lost all her sons and her daughters. And now she's worried that her husband is so sick, he's going to keel over and die himself. And it wasn't like they had State Farm back then. There was no life insurance. She'd be a widow. She'd be destitute and desolate with nothing. I may want to curse God too. By the way, Job does begin to question what in the world is going on. Job is Tom. He's a really good guy. He's blameless and upright, but he is still human. A little bit later in the book of Job, Job 27 verse 2, Job says, God has denied me justice. The Almighty has made my life bitter. This is so bad. Is God good? That's our question. For today. Here's what I want to do in order to get at this question. Is God good? I actually want to spend some time in the third part of that riddle that I shared with you. We have a God who's all powerful. We have a God who is all good. And yet there is evil that is in the world. I, I want to get to the question, is God good, by way of talking about the evil that is in the world. Because that's really what we struggle with. We struggle with all the bad stuff that we see and we experience that comes upon us, that hurts us, that destroys us. And so I want to give you just three thoughts about evil that will ultimately help us answer the question, is God good? 
And the first thought about evil is this. Evil is real. Evil is real. There's this haunting line from uh, Shakespeare's play Macbeth. Shakespeare says, Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face. There's not a day that goes by where something terrible and bad and evil and rotten doesn't happen. It's just the reality of our situation. Every single day, there's a new orphan. Every single day, a life is lost. Every single day, some sorrow strikes heaven on the face. And in our day and age, we do everything we can to try to avoid it, to cover it up, to make sure that we don't encounter it, but we will eventually. Evil is just a part of our world. Now, over the years, there have been countless ways to try to get around evil, to try to minimize evil, to try to downplay evil, to try to get rid of evil, or even pretend that evil doesn't exist. Uh, Sometimes, some people uh, will engage in a form of stoicism when they encounter evil. Stoicism basically says if you encounter evil and suffering and pain, keep a stiff upper lip. Don't let them see you hurting. Be a man. That's what stoicism says. Now, there's a problem with Stoicism. Stoicism destroys your own ability to acknowledge your own pain. In other words, you lose a little piece of humanity when you never admit that you hurt. Uh, But not only does it destroy your own ability to acknowledge your own pain, it also destroys your ability to empathize with other people and their pain. Because if you just kind of sock it through it, and you be a man, and you keep a stiff upper lip, if you see somebody else in pain, what are you going to tell them? Be a man, keep going, keep a stiff upper lip. If you can slog it through, they can too. Don't ever let anybody see you hurting. That's stoicism. Now, just so you know, this is not really helpful when you're confronted with evil. It's also not very biblical. Uh, There's this great story in John chapter 11. One of Jesus' dearest friends named Lazarus has gotten really sick and he dies from his disease. And although the story never tells us what it was that made Lazarus so sick, we do know this. Uh, Everybody who loved Lazarus was in deep mourning for Lazarus, including Lazarus' dear friend, Jesus. Uh, John 11, verse 33 says that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit, and he was troubled. He wants to go see where Lazarus has laid his tomb, and so he asks the people, John 11, verse 34, where have you laid him? And they take him to the tomb, and when he gets there, John 11, verse 35, it says very simply this, Jesus wept. Jesus ain't stoic. He doesn't always keep a stiff upper lip. He's deeply moved. He's upset in the face of evil, and we can be too. Stoicism is not a particularly helpful way to deal with evil in the world. Now, another way that people try to deal with evil in the world is the way of, of Buddhism. And Buddhism basically says that evil isn't really a thing. It's only an illusion. In fact, Buddhism has this thing that basically says not only is evil an illusion, pretty much everything is an illusion, including yourself. You yourself are an illusion. And so if you want to not deal with evil anymore, just kind of get outside of yourself. Escape yourself. That's what Buddhism would call enlightenment. Now again, this is not a particularly helpful way of dealing with evil. Just to say there is no evil, it's all an illusion. In fact, this is the exact opposite way of how God himself deals with evil according to the Bible. Because God himself doesn't try to escape the self. He actually comes into a self. The person of Jesus who doesn't try to escape evil. He actually confronts evil head on on the cross. Christianity, when it comes to evil and reality and illusions, teaches the exact opposite thing that Buddhism teaches. And here's the thing, even if you say it's all an illusion, I'm an illusion, evil's an illusion, everything's an illusion, those illusions still hurt a lot when they hit you square between the eyes, don't they? You can say evil isn't real, but when somebody passes away, when you get sick, when your kid goes crazy, when you lose your job, when tragedy hits, It doesn't matter what Buddhism says about whether or not it is real. It really feels real. By the way, 
The Christian faith affirms that that's right. The feeling's real. Evil's real, and so you can't just play it off and say it's an illusion. Another way to try to address evil is the way of moralism. Now, the way of moralism basically says the only reason that anything evil ever happens to you is because of something evil that you have already done. Moralism basically takes a cosmic karma view of the universe. Now, just so you know, this actually takes us back to the story of Job because this is the way that some of Job's friends respond to Job and all his suffering in this book. Uh, The story goes that after Job has lost everything, right, he's lost all of his animals, all of his money, his home, his kids, everything, and even his health, Uh, Job has three friends who come in from out of town to be with him. Uh, Their names are Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite, and then this other guy, Dadgum the Termite. Actually, I'm not sure that he really came. (laughs) Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that's not real. But anyway, uh, they come to Job to try to comfort him. And you know what they do? They try to comfort him using moralism. Uh, They basically say to Job, "Hey, hey, Job, Okay, so all this bad stuff has happened to you. Come on, fess up. What was it that you did to deserve this? I mean, surely God is angry at you for something. Uh, Job's friend Eliphaz puts it like this, Job 4, verses 7 and 8. Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble also reap it. Eliphaz says to Job, come on now, you reap what you sow. What evil thing did you sow? Come on. God knows, he knows what you did last summer when nobody was looking. You had to have done something. Here's the problem with Eliphaz's thinking. Who is Job? Job 1 verse 1. He was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Job was a righteous man. There was not some deep, dark, hidden, secret sin in him. Job was who he said he was. He was who he appeared to be. There's not always a one-to-one correlation between what you've done and what happens to you. Moralism doesn't work because it doesn't describe reality. And so you can't just go to someone and say, oh, you're suffering? Well, what'd you do to get that suffering? It's not helpful. It's not true. Now, a final way that some people try to deal uh, with evil in this world is through the way of secularism. And in some ways, secularism is kind of the mirror opposite of moralism. Moralism says the evil that happens to you is always your fault. You must have always done something to deserve it. Here's what secularism says. Secularism says the evil that happens to you is never your fault. You're never responsible. You're always just the victim. And so the best thing you can do with evil is not reflect on it, not learn from it, not seek to understand it. You just want to complain about it and excuse yourself from it and blame someone else for it. Now again, this is not helpful. It's not a helpful way to look at evil. Here's the thing, bad stuff that happens to you is not always your fault, but sometimes it might be. If you have an affair and your marriage falls apart, you're not just a victim, you've played a role in that. If you struggle with some sort of an addiction and you lose your job or your family, you're not just a victim. You've played a role in that. Here's the thing. We can be both victims of evil and perpetrators of evil. We can be both. And we need to acknowledge that and own up to that and learn from that. And so even if we try to minimize it or rationalize it or excuse it or run from it or pretend it doesn't exist, Evil's real. Stoicism, Buddhism, moralism, and secularism cannot get us around that. That's the first thing we need to know about evil in the world. Second thing we need to know about evil in the world. Evil is actually meaningful. Evil is meaningful. The bad things that befall us can actually teach us. Let's go back to Shakespeare. Uh, This time from his play, As You Like It, Shakespeare says, Sweets are the uses of adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in its head. In other words, Shakespeare says bad stuff can actually teach us good stuff. 
Uh, one of the great popes in church history was a guy named Gregory the Great. Uh, you may have heard of him before because he gave us something called Gregorian chant. He lived in the 6th century, and he actually talked about the meaningfulness of evil. He actually talked about all the different things that we can learn from evil, all the different things that evil can actually help us with. Gregory the Great identified three different ways that evil can help us. First way that evil can help us is it can correct wrong behavior. Sometimes, sometimes the evil that befalls us can help us with the, own e with the evil that we have in our lives. Uh, kind of the quintessential example of this in the Bible is a guy named Jonah. You may remember Jonah as a prophet who was called by God to go and preach to a city named Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Here's the problem. Jonah is a Jew, and Jews at this time hate Assyrians. And so when Jonah gets this mission and commission from God to go and preach to the capital of the Assyrian Empire, Jonah says in two words, no way. And he decides to pop smoke on a ship hopping the opposite direction. He tries to run away from God and run away from his assignment to Nineveh. What happens when Job hops on the boat? A big storm comes on the boat, and Job gets thrown overboard from the boat. And after that, a titanic tuna swallows Jonah. It's lots of bad stuff, and yet what is God trying to do? He's trying to correct wrong behavior. He's saying, Jonah, you're doing wrong, and so let me use a little bit of wrong to correct your wrong. Let me use some tragedy. Let me use some pain. Let me use some scary stuff to try to help you because that bad stuff can actually have meaning. Another way that evil can be meaningful is evil can actually prevent future calamities from happening. Again, kind of the quintessential example of this from the Bible is a guy named Joseph. You may remember Joseph as one of 12 sons. Joseph is favored by his father. In fact, he's the favorite son of his father. And as a token of his favoritism, his father gives to Joseph a coat of what? Many colors. Here's the problem. Joseph has these 11 brothers, and the 11 brothers become really, really jealous of daddy's favorite brother. And so what do the 11 brothers do? They decide that they're going to kill Joseph. They back off of that plan. They decide, okay, let's not kill him. Let's just enslave him. Let's sell him to a traveling band of Karavite Ishmaelite merchants. And the traveling band of, Car of Ishmaelite merchants, they take him down and they sell him into slavery to the Egyptians. Uh, Joseph winds up in jail. His whole life is a wreck until eventually he gets out of jail and he rises through the ranks of the Egyptian government to become second in command only to the pharaoh of Egypt where he manages to come up with a plan that saves all of Egypt and really all of the world from a massive famine that sweeps over the land. Now, the way that Joseph got to Egypt was not fun. It was not pleasant. It was the result of a whole bunch of evil from some very jealous brothers, and yet, through all of that evil, God saved the world from a future calamity. The whole world didn't starve to death because Joseph was in Egypt, and Joseph came up with a plan to save the world from a famine. It's bad stuff, but it's used toward a good end. That's meaningful evil right there. Third way that, meaning, that evil can have meaning in our lives is sometimes evil can simply be used to grow our personal faith. Evil can be used to grow our personal faith. It's a funny thing about suffering under evil. When you suffer under evil, when you lose everything you have and God is all you have left, you know who you tend to trust more? God. That's the story of Job. Job loses everything. And the only thing he has left at the end of it all is God. Which is why throughout the whole book, you know who Job is asking to speak to? God. Because God is all he has left. Job says in Job 13, I desire to speak to the Almighty and argue my case with God. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. And then he has this great line, Job 13, verse 16. Indeed, Job says, this will turn out for my deliverance. Job wants to speak with God because he's convinced that if he can just get an audience with God, it's all going to be okay. This is going to turn out for his deliverance. God is going to eventually and inevitably rescue him. 
what Job does is he looks beyond his present circumstance and he says, there has to be something else going on here. There has to be a bigger meaning happening here. There's some sort of meaning in all this because evil can be meaningful. And this leads me to the third thing then that we can learn from the story about evil. Evil is also redeemable. Evil is also redeemable. Here's what I mean. You know what my favorite part of this whole story is? My favorite part of this whole story is that Satan makes this bet with God. He says to God, does, does Job fear God for nothing? Because I don't think he does. I don't think there's any such thing as a covenant of self-giving, selfless love between God and human beings. I think the only reason that Job loves you, serves you, follows you, is devoted to you is because you've hooked him up and you've blessed him a lot. But that's all cynical. That's all tit for tat. That's all I scratch your back if you'll scratch mine stuff, to which God says, I think you're wrong. I do think there is such a thing as a covenant of self-giving, selfless love. So if you want to take away all of Job's possessions to prove that, go ahead. And you know what happens? Satan takes away everything. And you know what... I, also happens, Satan loses. And that's the good news of the book of Job. God and Satan make a bet, and who loses? Satan. There is such a thing as a covenant of self-giving, selfless love that is not based on what you can get. It is there just because. Here's what Satan's done. He's tried to use his evil to destroy Job and really destroy love. To prove that love is a farce. To prove that love is an illusion. To prove that selfless love isn't real. And Satan loses. You see, God uses Satan's bets to destroy Satan. God uses Satan's bets to beat up on Satan. And I don't know much, but I do think I know this. That sounds to me like that is pretty good. When Satan loses, and if God is the one who makes sure that Satan loses, you know what else is good? God is good. Even when things look really bad. And it's this that actually takes us back to that riddle. How do you solve this riddle? There's a God who's all powerful. There's a God who's all good. And yet there's evil in the world. Here's the thing. Most people will try to solve this riddle by cutting something out of the riddle. Uh, if there's evil in the world, you've got to get rid of God's power. You've got to get rid of God's goodness. You've you got to get rid of something. Actually, that's not the way you solve this riddle. You don't solve this riddle by taking something out of the riddle. You solve the riddle by adding something to the riddle. Be because there's something else we know about God. Not only is God all-powerful, and not only is God all good, God is also all knowing. And here's the reason this truth about God is so important. It means that when evil happens, God knows what he's doing even if you don't. God knows what's going on even if you can't fathom it. One of the fascinating features of the story of Job is that it's almost like a play with two stages. There's an upper stage and there's a lower stage. Okay? The lower stage is where Job and his animals and his kids and his house and his wife, Job's life is. The upper stage is where Satan and God are having this conversation. Now here's the great thing about the book of Job. In the book of Job, we can see the upper stage. We can hear the accusations that Satan is leveling against Job. We can hear God's responses to the accusations that Satan is leveling against Job. You know who can't hear God's responses to the accusations uh, that Satan is leveling against Job? You know who doesn't even know that Satan is up there with God leveling accusations? against Job. Job. 
We can see the upper stage. Job cannot. Now here's the thing. We can see the upper stage in Job's life, but you know where we can't see the upper stage? In our lives. There's stuff going on up there that we don't know, that we can't see, that we can't fathom, that we can't understand. But there is someone who does. And his name is God. He is all-knowing. And so here's the thing. If he's all-knowing, then maybe he's doing something that we can't fully know. And so instead of saying there's no way that God can be good, maybe the best response to this riddle is there is something that I don't know. It's really interesting. At the end of the book of Job, Job actually finally gets his wish. He's been saying to God, God, I want to talk to you. God, I want to see you. God, I want to hear from you so that I can plead my case with you. I don't know what's going on, and it's driving me nuts. And so at the very end of the book, uh, God actually shows up in a whirlwind in front of Job. And Job 38 verse 2 says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? That's what God leads with when he talks to Job. Why? Because God knows things that Job doesn't know, and God wants to remind Job that he knows things that he doesn't know. The fact of the matter is this. If you have a God who's powerful enough to be mad at because he allows evil to come into your life, you also have a God who's smart enough to have good reasons for allowing evil into your life that you cannot fully know. God does amazing things with things that look bad sometimes. You know, ultimately, the cross is kind of the proof in the pudding of this because nothing looked worse than the cross. And yet, ultimately, God used that bad thing for a great thing, for the salvation of many souls. People couldn't see it at the time. People couldn't know it at the time. But that's what God did for all time. You know, there's this great line from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, Mortals say of some temporal suffering when evil comes into your life, no future bliss can make up for it. But there's something they don't know. They don't know that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. Here's the promise. No matter how bad the stuff is that we encounter in this life, no matter how evil the world is that we live in, in this life. Ultimately, all of that bad stuff will melt away under the glory and the goodness of God. And that is really good. You know why? Because God is really good. And even if you can't know everything, you can know that. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, in this world that is full of evil, help us to remember that uh, there are some things that you know that we do not, that you can see that we do not. Uh, Father, you took something that looked so evil, called a cross with your son who was crucified, who suffered, who died, and you did something amazingly good with that. And so, Father, through a bet, you defeat Satan. Through a cross, you destroy him. When evil comes into our life, help us to remember that you know, you care, and you're there. Even if we don't know everything, may we know this, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. Walk with light.